The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell Obviously, be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process, and hopefully, you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors, or simply download the app. Advice Intelligence is the market leader in goals-based advice technology. Offering clients an end-to-end financial planning software solution, AI unleashes the true power of advice by providing a new world of advice software to enable planners to work smarter, not harder. Delivering financial advice in a way that's inspiring, cost-effective, and scalable. AI makes it easy for advisors to have enriched and engaged conversations with clients so they can solve their problems and explore future possibilities together. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm here with Ian Byrne. Ian's a Senior Financial Strategist at Evolution Financial based out of Cairns. Uh, Ian has a a super long uh, career in in financial advice, which I'll I'll let him explain. I'm sure he does a better job than me and took out the uh, 2021 Regional Advisor of the Year through the IFA Awards as well as named as a finalist for uh, a bunch of others as well couple of those I was up against him in. So, uh, Ian, mate, I'm, I'm keen to get some tips from you. Hopefully, uh, make my application a bit better for, for this year, mate. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Ben. And privileged to be here. I've looked up your bio as well, mate, and uh, you're a pretty accomplished young fellow as well. Well, look, I'd like to keep myself busy, but uh, I suppose that where XY came from and where this podcast has come from is is really that like when I started in advice and, and with the other uh, co-founders of the XY Advisor Group as well, we all basically had no idea what we were doing and we just started sharing information, had some mentors sharing information between each other and um, that helped us to improve and learn new things that we could focus on and make our advice better and For me, I think learning from other advisors is where it's at because these people are are doing it and not to say that you replicate what someone else is doing, that that will work for you because it probably won't, but picking up the elements that will and um, finding out what works and what didn't work and maybe trying to learn a few lessons from someone else's mistakes so that you can avoid making them yourself, always a little bit helpful. It's interesting you say that because both myself and Brad Stewart, who's the aspects that guys are doing and take it on board, if it works, why recreate the wheel? Absolutely. Yeah, I still I still remember the early conversations that we had in the infancy of XY Advisor where I'd joined I'd left a big, really established business to join a smaller company and basically talk myself into this role, which I didn't really have the skills to be able to deliver on. And I was fortunate to have a really good mentor and uh they would teach me a few things and we would charging, we'd just take insurance comms and basically not charge for SOAs and take a percent on farm and that you know work from a financial perspective but it wasn't giving me what I wanted from the advice relationships that I had with my clients and um yep. the mentor said he goes you just got to charge you just got to charge for your SOAs and I was like what you you mm. because yeah you just charge 500 bucks <laughs> I was like yeah. oh it's like you can do that okay and then so we did it <laughs> and then we we're sharing in this it was the XY that group and um we I was like, wow, I did this and I charged five hundred bucks this SOA. And they're like, whoa, like and then we just started and then it was just incremental uh things from there. So uh I'm yeah. certainly not too proud to say that everything that I've learned, I've learned from someone else that's done it more and better than me. Yeah. But um I yeah. think it's it's just the power of an idea is in its implementation and that's how we all get better together, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how we move from the cottage industry to the the profession that we're hoping to achieve absolutely 
Mate, so how about a, a, a good place to start? I thought, uh, talk us through your advice journey. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually uh, a bit of an accident. Um, you know, I, I stumbled into the profession at a reasonably young age. Um, so I, originally I went off and studied graphic art at college and uh, realised there's no real money in that. So fortunate enough to jump across into a National League volleyball team and uh, be employed by Queensland Volleyball in sports management. And um, then when I got married, I got told I, uh, I had to get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, I looked in the papers and fortunately at that stage, AMP were hiring and the regional office were blessed with an excellent uh, tech guru and uh, an absolutely amazing uh, recruitment manager. So Brownie and Dino, if you're listening, all respect to you boys, because that's why I'm here. And, and essentially, you know, learned on the job as I went, but importantly, just made sure that I, I had the study behind to fill it up. So I you know, did the DFP and then the CFP and continued moving through the the, the AMP world for a period of time, but realised that uh, institutional land put blinkers on what you could and couldn't do. So at that point in time, after winning a number of their awards, um, decided you know it was time to get out and go broader. So joined a, a large accounting firm, big national group, who uh, had a local branch, ten partners, eighty staff, headed up the financial planning division. And look, for as much as I learned through Deakin University, I have to admit that's probably where a lot of the real education began. You know, actually being in amongst it with accountants dealing with. Uh, some complex cases, um, and also just that uh, you know the uh, corporate politics <laughs> is a learning field in itself. Mm, so no doubt. yeah, so after a period of time, left the left the accounting firm, um, decided to get off that corporate merry-go-round, and um, started a, a business eventually uh, under my own branch. And uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, just merged with. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, Brad Stewart from the Townsville Group um, joined our two firms together, and uh, yeah, loving it. Well, I have a little bit of insight um, there, but it, into what you're doing, and it, I feel like one of the strengths of you guys as a business is that you're totally crushing it with your referrals and centers of influence, in particular, and uh, going from that accounting firm where, well, you told me you would tell me offline that you know, it was a real struggle to get that actually moving to where you are today. I'm keen to unpack that a little bit more. Like how, how did you tackle it? What what were yeah. the things like, how can we be doing better when it comes to pumping our centers of influence? Because I know everyone talks about this, but like for me, it's it's a code that I've just never been able to crack. Yeah, yeah. And look, that's a great question. Um I suppose the first thing you've got to realise is particularly particularly accountants are a different species altogether. Um, they're very cautious about the fact that while they're relatively great in regards to taxation and structures and planning from that perspective, when it comes to actual financial planning, to a large degree, most of them don't have any real knowledge, but they obviously don't want clients to be aware of that. Um mm. So the first thing you've got to do is, I suppose, prove that you're not going to be a threat, that you're not going to expose aspects that they may not know. Um, and uh, and I can hear you asking the question, that's fine, but how do you, how do you actually even get to that stage first? Mm. Um, we've found in the past, by actually making a few referrals to a firm, to an accounting firm first, and then following it up with a you know a letter or an email or a quick phone conversation saying, hey, look, heard great things about you, send a few clients across to you, can it catch up for a lunch or a or a coffee at some stage? Let me know if you're free. I mean, who's gonna knock that back, right? Hmm. So if 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 you want a referral initially, you've got to prove that you've got some kind of value to give. And particularly with the new relationship with an accounting firm, um, we tend to baby them in the fact that they'll get a copy of our file notes, they'll get a copy of the statement of advice, they'll get a summarised version as well. And throughout the statement of advice, if it's relevant, we'll actually mention the accounting firm a number of times as well. Mm. So that way they see that 
hey, these guys know what they're doing. They're not all about the glory. They're about giving the right type of advice. Um, and professionally, they look good by making that referral across to you as well. I love that. I think it makes sense. And it, particularly, if obviously, you do your due diligence beforehand. But for Correct. any good about, uh, advice business, it's like those accounting referrals, are, are like you need that as a solution anyway. It's hard to find good accounting practices that will look after your clients. And um, I don't think our clients really have massively high expectations of accounting because we've got a lot of good players in particularly in the individual um, PAYG type space as well. So uh, I like it as opposed to just that cold email and trying to drum something up that way, get some runs on the board and, and go from there. It's also Ben, it's also about um, making sure the accounting firms that you one as referral partners or, or centres of influence or basically just professional partners, they align with the types of clients that you're chasing or, or your ideal clients, but also from perspective of um, having the same ethics and you know culture fit and all the rest of it. Um, we tend to find, look, the guys who deal in that high net worth area um, yeah, have great reputation um, can be very serious, can work very hard, but by the same token, know how to enjoy themselves and relax and actually have a bit of humour. Mm. That's the group that we love working with. Yeah, I like it because it's that's the the other thing that we've really struggled with that you get referred then clients in that don't fit the mould, and you sort of feel like because they've come from a relationship with a with a partner that you that you want to you know do make sure that that person is really happy so that the referral partner is happy, but it sometimes ends up being non-commercial, which which can be an issue. How have you yeah. gone about um, ensuring that you you do get a good amount of sort of lead flow back from the partners once you do you know establish that relationship? So we, we run a few things with our accountants um, throughout the year. Um, probably the main one that we do is like a education seminar where we host it at their expense. We'll either run the sessions or we'll actually get in um, very qualified speakers, um, you know, from state planning lawyers or taxation specialists and essentially put them in an environment where we're adding value to to them having the their bums off their office seat because, mm. again, you've got to bear in mind, these guys charge in six-minute increments mostly. Mm-hmm. So if you're trying to take the partners out of a accounting firm plus potentially some of their better professional staff, they can't help but add up the cost to that. So you've always got to be conscious yeah. of adding value back the other way. Mm. Make sure that you throw on you know, morning tea or afternoon tea or something after it so you can do the meet and greet and the talk and all the rest of it. Um, but again, it does also help if you've got one or two clients that you can refer reasonably quickly after that you know, that, that seminar, et cetera, because then they're seeing value on value on value. Yes. And we, we organise, I'd like to say monthly meetings, but that's probably a bit of a stretch. It's probably more... Four meetings a year where we sit down with the accountants in their office for about an hour, hour and a half and run through our whip to any common clients that we may have, um, run through where we're at with them. But also importantly, even if we don't have any common clients at that point in time because it's a new relationship, talk about very topical aspects that are common across both our professions. And again, once the guys start seeing, hey, this guy's not an idiot, um, he knows what he's talking about. He's speaking the language I talk. He he can relax enough and have a bit of a joke without being a you know a fool. Um, you know, it's amazing the guards start coming down. And once you crack that nut, and you can mm. get a few of these people in the same room at the same time, it's mag- it's amazing the kudos that you actually get from that cross pollination. And so do you just set the expectations at the front end of the relationship that you will be doing those those four meetings a year? Is that is that how you yeah, get there? Yeah, definitely. Look, it's it, because one of the things we're, we're very focused on is um, it's a professional relationship. Yeah, even though as, uh, as time goes on, normally you develop a friendship, so you might throw in some social activities. But from the very start, it's important to show that 
you know, without slandering AMP, but you're not just an old AMP agent out to make <laughs> some commission because that's the impression a lot of people still unfortunately have about financial planners. Yes. The accountants are very particular about having that white picket fence around their clients, so they're very careful about who they open the gate to. Mm. And if you can prove that you're very professional, you're very upfront, you're totally transparent, the advice that you give is actually purely in benefit for the client, obviously commercial, then that gate starts opening wider and wider. Um, I, I must say too, a bit like yourself, we still get clients who are referred through who aren't our ideal client, but we've mastered the art of having a great conversation initially with those clients. So we'll always mm. get them in to meet, have a great conversation, provide some general information. If they're not our ideal client, we're more than happy to make a on referral to another financial planning firm that we think they'll be uh, better serviced. So we're very, very particular and very, very specific about who we take on and, and where we can add value. Yeah, and I think you have to be these days if you want to have a commercial business for sure. So that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Ian, what's um, what have been the biggest shifts for you as an advisor and, and with what you're doing in business? Um, oh, geez, tell you what, what, what hasn't <laughs> been a big shift? <laughs> um, yeah, apart from all the stuff that everyone's had to face over the last, well, really ever since DFC in regards to, you know, the, the changes in our profession or industry making us towards a profession, I'd have to say, look, just immediately pre-COVID and post-COVID, we've probably done the most uh, defining and focusing of our business that we've ever done. And a great catalyst was when we merged, uh, you know, the Cairns and Townsville offices into one primary business because it made both Brad and I sit down and go, okay, where should we be focusing our energy? Where can we add the most value? And ultimately, where are we going to become um, most profitable and most successful in? Um, so over the last three years, we've literally changed our financial planning software, changed our uh, investment platform, added on an MDA service where we're very active in that area. More recently, we've included an SMA service for our direct Australian equity exposure for clients' portfolios, totally transitioned out our reasonably substantial risk book because that's an area that we decided we we weren't able to service adequately anymore. So we literally passed that out to another planning firm for free, didn't actually try to sell it, just passed it out to make sure those clients were looked after properly. Switched offices, so we designed the new office, had it all built, relocated. And, and the interesting part to all of that was... I suppose it really brought to the foremost of our mind how important good quality staff are mm. because we can have all the great plans in the world, but if we're trying to do all these changes, define what we're doing better, focus on our clients better, do all those technological and physical changes, but on top of that, also try to service and maintain our current clients plus onboard new clients Geez, you know, we, we couldn't have done it with the uh, without having a mate and staff. Mm. And that, I think, it's something that I've been focused a lot on over the last, well, since getting after the initial shock of COVID where our team, our business, my business grew from a micro business to a not so micro business. And I realized how important that piece is as a business grows. What have been the biggest learnings for you there and, and what do you think is, is really important when it comes to setting your staff up for success? Look, I, I suppose um, we've always had an open door policy in regards to our, our staff and how we treat our staff, um, which is very easy to say um, because most people, I suppose, say that until they decide they want to close the door. Um, yeah. But realistically... We, we empower our staff to look at things, think through the problem and actually come up with the solution before they even present the problem to us in the first place. Because if 99% of the heavy lifting is done, and it may not be the solution that we actually implement, but it may, it's already started us down the right pathway of how to approach it or think about it. Um, so that's one of the biggest aspects. The other aspect, I suppose, too, is... Um, you know, I've been in the 
profession for a fair period of time. And for as much as I've learnt through my university studies and the never-ending, ongoing, continuous education requirements that we have, it's also fair to say that I've probably learnt twice as much from working with great clients and dealing with great professionals. Yeah, you know, it's it's really been a privilege for me to watch good people live good lives, make good decisions, raise good families, and do it in all in such an effortless, smart, sensible uh, way that realistically, um, you know, it, it's it's really an honour for us to be able to watch these people live their lives in front of our eyes. Mm. For us, I've been lucky to work with a few quite successful business owners and I've found that some of the learnings that I've picked up from them have, have given me <laughs> like better tips than all the coaches and uh, all mm. the work that we've done and the reading uh, internally as well because I think like sort of what we were talking about at the start that when you've got someone that's done it before and learned those lessons that you, you can you know, sort of pick up a few things that can stop you from having to avoid some of the mistakes on your own. Yeah, and, and look, our profession... We've always got to guard against the inherent arrogance that we can allow to build up within us, um, a bit like the teaching profession, you know, and hopefully if you have any teachers as, as uh, listeners, they don't get offended. But the one thing that I find amongst them is they tend to preach. They don't tend to talk or listen. They're so used to being in front of the class and instructing or teaching that that becomes ingrained and because as advisors we tend to have the answers for the clients so you've really got to train yourself to actually look at the clients in a different way to find out what you can actually learn from them Um, and, and when you think about it how amazing if you're dealing with successful clients and successful professionals you know accountants and and legal advisors that's like someone's opened the playbook in front of you and said here's here's the roadmap yeah, how foolish would you be not to, to, to be studying that in depth? Yeah, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. I hope my mum isn't listening because she's a teacher for 30 odd years. <laughs> and she might get offended as well. But Sorry, uh, Mrs. Nash. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, what, um, what's coming up for you guys? What are you focused on today? Um, today, oh, geez. Um, we've got a couple of, couple of big family groups. So we, we specialise in ultra high net worth and high net worth family succession. Um, So we've got a couple of family groups on the go who are just amazing people, just wonderful to work with. We're into intergenerational planning um, and we're at the pointy end now where we're trying to get a few little pieces in a play, but also getting obviously, you know, the the holy benediction from the accounting firm that we're, we're closely involved with in regards to some of our strategies. But by the same token, also having the uh, the estate planning specialist who's popping around tomorrow morning um, to to essentially give us the, uh, the the go ahead from their perspective as well. Nice. And how did you end up in that space? Um, by design, I suppose, and, and by default. Um, to to get back to the accounting referral, look, I, I can't highlight how important that can be for a business. But also the whole ongoing education perspective in regards to just making sure that you just constantly try to broaden your knowledge as far as possible. Um, Mm -hmm. It's easy for us to get caught up in our own world, but if you can learn as much as you can, and I see you've got a commerce degree yourself, but if you can try to learn as much as you can behind the scenes of how the accountants think and how the, the estate planners think, then you can sit quite comfortably at the same table as them and speak their language and technical terms and terms that they're comfortable with so that mm. when the big cases or the big clients have issues, they've got zero hesitation sending them across to you. So I suppose it's a bit, bit by design over the years of chiseling away and framing who our ideal clients are, but actually them putting, um, you know, putting, uh, putting proof to it all by showing the accountants that we can deal with the the clients as they send them through. And so those clients are primarily coming from the the accounting partners and the centres of influence that you've fostered? 
Yeah. So we don't do any advertising at all. Um, literally, we're 100% referral word of mouth from existing clients. So existing clients who you associate with like with like um, have no hesitation sending friends and family across to us. And, and I must say, one of the things that we state at the outset when we're dealing with the high net worth and ultra high net worth groups is we fully expect that we won't just deal with mum and dad, that we'll be dealing with the adult children and most likely the grandchildren as they become adults too. Um, and the way we frame that is, you know, you don't go to a to a food court and try to get a Japanese cook to cook your French cuisine with an American hamburger on the side. You know, you've got to really have a, an overall view of where the family's at if you're going to make sensible strategic decisions on not only how the wealth is going to pass down, but what the legacy is that you want that the parents themselves, the primary clients want to pass down to the family. Mm, that also makes a lot of sense and obviously good for business if you're picking up multiple generations of the clients as well. Yeah, yeah. And look, one, one question we ask the primary clients that I suppose most planners don't ask is aside from the facts and figures, you know, what's your story? Like how did you become successful? Tell me your story. You know, I'm, I'm interested to learn how they met, mm. how they made their money. You know, did they inherit it? Did they make a brilliant business and, and sell it at a period of time? Did they do it in property? You know, did they do direct shares, et cetera? But then keep digging and digging and digging and just ask the questions about them. And from there, the rest of it very much flows out because they realize they actually taken a personal interest in themselves. And so when we then state, look, ultimately, we will become the planning firm, not only for yourselves, but for your children, because it just logically makes sense for all these plans that you have in place for them to make sure that it plays out the way you want it to. Um, we, we have zero resistance. And then we normally organize uh, a family meeting where the primary clients and the immediate family members, so no in-laws or outlaws, whatever you want to call them, are allowed to come. It's just for them. And this is normally down the track a fair bit once mum and dad have decided, hey, this is a process and this is a path and these are our desires. Um, and again, even in a couple of families where we've had maybe a little bit of strained relationship with, say, the parents and one child, et cetera, we've tended to find by having it all on the table and all r rationally explained and also you know, working out what, how and when, again, we haven't had any major issues when it's ultimately come time for it all to play out. And normally that's when dad or mum and dad have both passed away. It's a very sensible, logical way of actually easing that inter intergenerational succession of wealth and legacy mm -hmm. across the next generation and then next generation again. Well, I think that, that that deep care of the individual and then tying it back to what their what the real aspirations are for the family makes a lot of sense because the the experience that I've had working with people at that level is it is it's about much more than the money because they've got more than enough money so it's like what else sits around that and I think if you're if you're only talking about how to get the best investment return or um, how to be the sharpest on fees to to look after things then you're probably missing a pretty significant part of what's actually important there as well. Yeah. And my last yeah. question for you is uh, if you could go back and do one thing differently, what would it be? Look, if, if I was given advice to the, the younger Ian Byrne, um, it would literally be to back yourself earlier. You know, it's really, um, I suppose when you're young and you're, you're trying to achieve things and you're, you're relatively clueless, you tend to join up with groups or you tend to try to go down paths that, like you said before, in regards to, you know, the, the commission versus actually paying for a statement of advice, you tend to go down paths that are wrong turns. Um, definitely when I first left the accounting firm and joined another organisation where, you know, myths of the GFC, the two business partners I was with at the time, 
were uh, talking about buying new Mercedes and we'd just literally said to the staff there were no pay rises. I look back at aspects like that and go, yep, they were good learning experiences, but realistically, geez, I, I probably wasted a good three years of my life where I could have actually gotten on the road by myself earlier if I just backed myself a bit earlier. So, yeah, that's that's the aspect, I suppose, that you know, if you're a young financial planner starting out, really have a focus on what it is you want to be doing, who you want to be doing it with, and ultimately how you're going to do it. And if you can do that and if you can formulate your strategy well enough around that, then just back yourself and go for it. Because in this current environment we're facing with huge demand and um, for our services, yeah, you know, literally, you'd you'd have to be a pretty bad planner if you're if you're not doing okay at this point in time. It's amazing how many times that one's come up when I ask that question to to people on the podcast. That um, yeah, they they most people don't regret the learnings that they've gone through because it helps them get to to where they are. But uh, going sooner on some of the things and backing yourself is a common theme. So probably a lesson there for for anyone listening in. Um, make sure you know dot your eyes and cross your t's, but then go for it. Yeah, yeah, and and look, like I said, my my own children. Um, yeah, you know, sometimes the most expensive mistakes are actually the most valuable lessons, and that's how you turn a negative into a positive. So I, I don't regret aspects like that. But by the same token, geez, it'd be nice if uh, if someone just patted you on the back and said, "Come on, son, you can do it. Off you go." Yeah, um, have a few uh, have a few more dollars in the bank account most of the time as well. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, mate, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's awesome to to watch you kicking those goals, and I look forward to rubbing shoulders with you down at the IFA Awards uh, in a couple of months. Yeah, definitely, mate. Uh, hopefully, we'll both be up on the podium at various times, and we can uh, we can raise a champagne glass. Nice one, mate. Well, I very much look forward to that. Mates, uh, yeah, I'll see you there. And team, we will catch you on the next one. Excellent. Cheers, Ben. Bye now.